program. Today is the 112th Security Thought Leadership Webinar. And what we try and do in these thought leadership webinars is we critique what's going on today in order that we may get a better type of security tomorrow. So in the next 45 minutes, the aim is not to try and solve the problems, but to try and increase thinking about them, to give a view about what's going on and how we may interpret trends. And our topic today is another important subject matter. It's one about uh, uh, the role of drones and security and the idea that we need to balance the opportunities drones bring with the threat that they pose, the threat and the opportunity. And once again, I've got three panelists, again, from different parts of the world that are going to be offering their views. So in a second, what I'll do is I'll invite them in to, to introduce themselves. Uh, once the three of them have done that, we'll come to each of them for that opening statement. They each get three minutes to say whatever they want to about the subject matter. And then we'll invite you, the audience, to ask questions. So can I encourage you, please, to get your questions in early? Please use the button at the bottom of your screen, the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and I'll endeavour to incorporate your question into the ensuing discussion. Another important topic this is. So without further ado then, let's get going and let's uh, meet our panellists. First of all, we go to Hong Kong and uh, Jeff. Jeff, can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jeff Moore. I am a member of the Risk Security and Resilience Team for Arab. I'm based in uh, Hong Kong, um, uh, but I've worked all over Europe, uh, the Middle East, Africa and Asia on a variety of different infrastructure protected projects. And I specialize in autonomous vehicles and uh, drones. Thank you very much indeed, Jeff. Uh, let's go then uh, uh, back nearer to home to me, or at least nearer to me home. Uh, um, uh, Richard, please can you introduce yourself? Hi there, Martin, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm Richard Gill. I'm the founder and CEO of Drone Defence. We're a UK-based drone monitoring startup, and we help people and organisations protect themselves from the harmful use of commercial drones. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. And then we go to the other side of the world, the other way westwards, and we meet Steve. Steve, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much for having me here. I am a Canadian American, so I'm a North American. My name is Steve Reinhars. I am the founder and president of Robotic Assistance Devices. We create autonomous ground vehicles, stationary devices, and drones, specifically for the security and facilities management market. Thank you very much indeed. I know a lot of you write to me and say to me, don't we choose good panelists and good topics? And once again, I think you can see we've got uh, another set of experts. So without further ado then, those of you who've been on the previous 111 webinars, now at this point, what we do is we ask each of our panelists in three minutes to give us their opening statement, their chance to say whatever they want to say about this subject matter. So Jeff, your opening statement, please. Uh, thanks, Mark. You know, there's, there, are, there are lots and lots of areas of subject that we could talk about uh, to, to do with the, the, the pro and the counter drone topic and the use of autonomous vehicles in, in different types of applications. One of the things that I've noticed a lot over the, over the, the years that I've been involved in, in uh, protecting infrastructure from uh, autonomous vehicles and drones is um, a, a, a lack of understanding mostly in the market about what these vehicles really represent. And to some extent, we're coming at the problem from the wrong direction. If you think of the, uh, if you think of an analogy from the automobile industry, or the start of the automobile industry, in the beginning there were very, very few. They drove around with very little infrastructure, but because there were very few of them, um, uh, they they managed okay, and things were relatively safe. Um, the people that used them were a mixture of um, uh, uh, early adopters who just liked the novelty of them, and a few people who actually had some valid uses of them. And as the, the use or the, the the adoption of motor vehicles spread more and more of them in the environment, we got to a point where we had to start establishing some infrastructure in order to be able to uh, make things safe and orderly. And that's when governments got involved, putting regulations in place and starting to think about the building of the infrastructure. And that's kind of where we are with the drone sector right now. But at that, this stage in the automobile sector, we didn't suddenly come up with an, uh, a counter automobile industry. We found ways to manage the threats of automobiles through regulations, and also made, we found ways to, to, to look at protecting certain types of infrastructure from vulnerabilities that were associated with vehicles. Uh, we've seen the hostile vehicle mitigation market sort of grow very rapidly in the last few years over the, the use of uh, vehicles as a weapon. And what this is where some of the, 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 the sort of the, the parallels with the, with the uh, drone sector set, except that cars are big, easy to detect, 
it's easy to spot them on the road coming down to do, towards you, unlike um, cattle, for instance, or people, which is the analogy with birds flying in the sky around drones. Um, but it's very difficult to detect the good car from a bad car. You can't tell the difference. And many of the technologies that we're currently using at the moment to detect drones in the sky are like trying to do, um, either trying to detect a very hard to, to spot vehicle on the road uh, or detecting um, a, a vehicle as being hostile because you can hear the car radio uh, blurting out of the window. And those technologies are not going to work particularly well with, with as, as infrastructure increases, as the quantity of drones in the sky increases, and as people start to put in place more generic infrastructure for the management of more autonomous vehicles. My position is that we need to start looking at, the, at how we protect infrastructure in a much more holistic manner. We can't just be thinking about drones. We certainly shouldn't be concentrating on hobby drones because they're not where the majority of the threats lie. But we need to start thinking about hostile autonomous vehicles of all forms, not only in the sky, but also on the ground. And we need to start thinking seriously and realistically about whose responsibility it is to put in place the mitigation technologies that are going to be required to protect our facilities and our infrastructure in the future as this form of, tank, of, uh, of uh, mode of transport begins to become more and more popular. Thank you very much indeed. OK, some excellent points there and ones we can uh, clearly pick up on in the ensuing discussion. Don't forget, audience, if you'd like to get your question in early, please use the question answer button at the bottom of your screen. And when we've heard from the panelists, we'll endeavour to incorporate your questions. OK, without further ado, then, uh, thank you very much indeed, Jeff. Now let's go to Richard. And Richard, your opening statement, please. Thank you, Martin. Um, I believe we sort of stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way that we live, work and relate to one another. Its scale and scope and complexity in the forthcoming transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. The first industrial revolution uh, was characterised by water and steam um, power to mechanise production. The second uses electricity to create mass production and the third used electronics to transform um, information technology to automate production. Building on the previous, uh, the digital revolution has been developing over the last 30 years. It's characterized by the fusion of information and technology, which is blurring the lines between the physical and digital domains. It's powered by data, it's enabled by advances in computing and machine learning and nascent artificial intelligence. Now, I believe drones are a uniquely significant technology in this fourth industrial revolution. Fully autonomous drones of all sizes will, uh, could be powered from sustainable energy sources, eliminating CO2 for the transport network. And I believe that their impact will be at least as significant as the internal combustion engine. So as mentioned before, I'm Richard Gill. I'm the founder of Drone Defence, and I'm here to talk about some of the issues that I've seen over the last five years with the development and adoption of drone technology. So, and I'd like to ask everybody to feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn uh, after this. So I believe that drones are amazing. They will change the way we view, interact with, and eventually move around our planet. And I think the reason why I think this is throughout history, civilizations have been built on the communication structures available at the time. The oldest continuously have inhabited cities in the world sprang up again along the Silk Road. The Egyptian empire was built along the Nile. The Europeans spread out across the oceans. The railroad expanded the, the American West. Roads, cars, airports, and latterly the internet have shaped the way we live our lives. And drones are the next chapter in this story. So while others seem to be looking towards self-driving cars as the answers to some congestion problems facing the world, I believe we should be looking to the skies. Imagine the impact if autonomous drones were to transport goods and services in cities and take 10 to 20% of road traffic away. The positive impacts would be enormous, taking many cars off the road. We reduce congestion, air pollution, maintenance costs, and road traffic accidents. And when drones can be powered through renewable sources, the proposition becomes even more compelling. However, there is a risk, and we've recognised that the same technology that is being used uh, is being used by reckless, ignorant, and criminal, including terrorist users, to invade privacy, steal secrets, disrupt events, airports, and smuggle drugs into prisons. Drone defense solely exists to help organizations of all shapes and sizes to prepare, prepare and protect themselves from this emerging threat. We've developed cost-effective proprietary technologies to detect, track, and identify uh, before defeating um, harmful commercial drones. Uh, by preventing drone misuse, we, we enable the advancement of the industry and provide a viable security solution um, while enabling the industry. Without us, I think that the authorities would have no choice but to regulate access to drones, 
and this would have a damaging effect on the industry. So by tracking all aircraft, we aim to unlock the skies. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Really very interesting. Wow, lots of good stuff coming out here. Don't forget, question in, please, using the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. And when we've come to the third panelist, we'll uh, um, look to uh, incorporate your questions. So question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you very much indeed then, Richard. Let's go to Steve over um, in the US. Steve, your opening statement, please. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, thanks again for having us here. What a fantastic, uh, absolutely fantastic panel. We are firmly a fourth industrial revolution company. Uh, earlier this year or last year, I think it was last year, we published uh, what we call our autonomous remote services manifesto. Uh, hopefully it'll be, uh, there'll be a link included in, in the package as this gets distributed, but it's an easy to read document that helps inform people, what does that really mean? We're not going through the first three industrial revolutions in that much depth, but we're really talking about how the fourth industrial revolution links instant communications, primarily through 5G, but right now mainly 4G, along with AI powered uh, devices and enhanced mobility solutions. What RAD is doing is we're taking those fundamentals of the fourth industrial revolution, we're using them to revolutionize the security industry and facility management industry. What we see is a vision of the future where we have a combination of uh, very active drones performing significant functions at facilities, combined with stationary and ground mobile um, devices, all of which are AI enabled, AI powered, remotely connected to humans for, uh, for oversight and, and advanced, uh, advanced um, functionality. So what, uh, what, where I'm in right now is I'm just uh, leaving Detroit. We just opened up our third uh, and by far our largest production and research and development location. This location is gonna feature a uh, 50 by 50 by 50 in feet. Um, drone cage for uh, testing our advanced drone uh, applications as well as, well as a 20,000 foot um, uh, outdoor rugged uh, uh, unmanned ground vehicle test, test track. So uh, that combined with the production research and development is really gonna enable us to start testing, deploying uh, these solutions throughout North America and the world. Uh, at the moment, RAD has been able to capture the imagination of 25 of North America's top dealers. We've more or less have the entire dealer uh, channel uh, in security guarding and facilities management uh, in North America. And the industry is starting to deploy our solutions and is anxious to see what we, what we are gonna be deploying uh, over the next uh, months and years. A very exciting time for us. Uh, I feel this is, uh, I feel uh, we're pioneers uh, in, this, in this new age that is not only moving fast, but is uh, definitely has some elements that are uncomfortable and scary that we've never dealt with before. And I believe that we have a duty and obligation to continuously communicate what that really means um, and help uh, governments uh, and decision makers navigate us into a, into a bright future as opposed to uh, a dystopian future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, look, uh, very, very good. Well, look, lots of stuff there. Um, um, we've got some positive uh, about its opportunities. We've had some identifications of some of the problems. Let's see if we can uh, pin, pin our panel down a bit on some of these issues. Let's go first of all, Jeff, I'll come to you first with this question. Uh, and then uh, you, Richard. Uh, it's from Jamie Williamson. And uh, uh, Jeff, Jamie says, a recent United Nations working group meeting in Geneva a number of United Nations independent experts, NGOs and governments raised the concerns of the private security industry in high risk environments using armed drones. How realistic is this scenario? Could we see in the not too distant future mobile static armed security services being replaced by armed drones? Now, let's uh, let's go to you first to see whether it can be whether it can be whether it's likely to happen and then what some of the implications are. Jeff first. Um, well, well, it's already happened. Um, and in, if you look at, in, as if, for instance, in the in the US, in the nuclear sector, um, the use of remotely operated uh, uh, um, um, uh, weapons stations is, is actually is authorized on, on the perimeters of nuclear facilities. And so they're ground based autonomous or semi autonomous or, or, or remotely piloted uh, gun emplacements, if you like. Um, so so we're, we're kind of one step away from 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 this situation to put those into the into the air. 
the question is always going to be whether it's worth putting them in the air because you might as well put them into a vehicle which you know a ground vehicle which doesn't have to overcome the, the law of gravity and can 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 be can can meld into the uh the streetscape with all of the other vehicles uh and, and ca carry a much more deadly and more significant payload but as far as carrying weapons on uh, on drones or on 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 land aerial vehicles well the size of vehicles is increasing all of the time whilst we have um manufacturers making very very small drones uh, in order to uh, circumvent regulations and, be, and and get into the into the market very easily uh, which don't carry particular weapons uh, a, a, a largest size drones even commercially drones that are manufactured for things like the movie industry that are designed to carry big heavyweight camera equipment could easily be uh, you know uh, equipped with with other forms of weapon and it's just as as likely in fact that um, a, a hostile actor might use uh, and a non-lethal weapon. Uh, they might use a harmless white powder type attack in order to create disruption in, in, uh, in crowded spaces. They might use um, um, a wireless access points in order to be able to effectively war drive through crowds and pick up uh, unsecured mobile devices or unsecured access points and gain access to data. Or you could even use like, for instance, in the, uh, a recent event in China where a swarm of drones created a barcode in the sky so that the thousands and thousands of people in the crowd who were already pointing their cameras at this uh, their mobile phone cameras at this barcode could automatically be redirected to a website to pick up a, a, a coupon to give them a, a cheap burger at McDonald's. But a similar um, a similar type of uh, highly covert uh, phishing attack could be used to direct people to any kind of website to pick up any kind of information uh, sharing uh, medium or any kind of a virus. Um, so, so the way the weaponization of drones is much more complicated than thinking simply about attaching guns or rockets or bombs to them. There are many, many different ways in which drones can be weaponized. And um, certainly they're now becoming large enough, particularly in, in the eVTOL sector, which is also burgeoning and seeing an awful lot of investment around the world. Um, these things are large enough to be able to carry uh, um, uh, explosive devices of a similar size to that carryable by a, a small car. And so um, it's a, it, is, it is a complex sector. Uh, it's not a, it's not something that we need to spread doom and gloom around because uh, obviously there are many benefits to the sector, but it's something that we should, we need to be cognizant about, and we shouldn't just run uh, sort of gung ho into this sector, uh, particularly not deploying lots and lots of um, cloud based services from untrusted third parties uh, via these systems to make it easy for us for the, for the manufacturers to get their drones into service. Uh, because many of these um, many of these uh, cloud-based services now are highly vulnerable, and many of the the sources for IoT-based devices that are being used in drones uh, are, are from dubious sources that don't have particularly secure supply chains. Check chains, and uh, I think we just need to be very very uh, cognizant of the ways, the many many ways in which these things can be a threat in uh, in the right in the wrong hands. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to come to Jeff and Steve on this if I can, because. Um... Um, uh, sorry, Richard and uh, uh, Steve on this. I mean, Richard, um, that sounds quite worrying to me. Uh, shouldn't we all be quite worried about the potential here? With because uh, um, the trouble with the security world, I think, Richard, is it's tempting, of course, to go on about what the opportunities are, and of course, you've all mm -hmm. rightly outlined those. But of course, they come with this heightened risk, and that sounded to me quite worrying, Richard. No, I agree. And I think it's a fascinating question from Jamie. Um, so thanks for asking it. And I think there is opportunity, all new technology, everything has the ability to be abused. And as I hold this pen in my hand, I can write something beautiful with it. I can write hate, hate mail with it. It depends how it wants to be used by its end user. Now, we do get asked this question an awful lot. And, and you can see on one end of the spectrum, you could see commercial drones being used by, um, by terrorists in, in Iraq, uh, and Afghanistan to drop small uh, high explosive devices. And one of the analogies that I'll give, I was at a conference with um, some US uh, forces guys, and they said as they pushed ISIS through um, Fallujah, that at any one time there were 70, 70 um, small commercial drones, DJI Phantoms, that were dropping 40 millimeter HE grenades on coalition forces trying to move out. So the US had absolute um, air superiority, but at the tactical level, they didn't because the insurgent had these commercial drones. So that the asymmetric effect that people can have um, with this technology uh, is, is well known. Uh, but thankfully, there is always there's a finite number of people who want to cause that level of harm using this technology. And we have to bear that in mind, it's the opportunity versus the probability. And I think the other point is, and it's sort of linked to what how Jeff's opening speech is that um, 
when new technology is introduced, there's always this natural aversion from society. People are uncomfortable with, with drone technology. Uh, and the analogy that I use is when we were growing up, the, the drones that were on TV were Robocop and they were Terminator. And this concept of machines walking around shooting people, is, I think, is the root of this question almost, is that um, we do have remotely operated things, but are they, are they the drones we're talking about? Or are, more, are people more uncomfortable with the, the idea of autonomous weaponized platforms that can make their own kill decisions almost? But because I think as an ex-military person, we always treat, try to keep a person in the loop. Um, and, and my experience of drones came from the military. So, so do we want a thing where we introduce a red flag act and somebody has to walk in front of the first cars with a red flag and they're limited to five miles an hour uh, and they've got to have two pilots? Or do we have to balance this risk of, yeah, there are bad people in the world who can use thing, uh, this technology along with a myriad of other technologies to cause harm, but the probability is actually quite small. Uh, um, Steve, do you think the, A, the probability is quite small um, and B, uh, get the positives. How do we mitigate this concern? Because it's quite obviously quite a legitimate concern, Steve. That's a great question. Martin, I, I, I fear that I, uh, my qualifications pale in comparison to Richard's and Jeff's. Uh, I don't feel qualified really to, to give a thorough answer on that. My focus is really much more on commercialization of technology, you know, chasing 5% of uh, bottom line profits for, for corporations in Canada, United States. So I'm sorry, but uh, it was fascinating listening to the other panelists give the answers. Okay, so just, just I wonder whether um, I could put, uh, play to that strength, though. To what extent, though, in doing that, in, in getting buy-in uh, um, to the product, is there a concern and how much is that concern managed uh, either through technology, through persuasion. I mean, what presumably it's not new to you to have to right. confront. That. So, so in a commercial environment, what do you say? I'll, I'll, I'll draw a parallel when we talk about risks and we talk about probability and possibility. Is it possible? Of course it's possible. Is it happening? Probably it's happening, right? You know, just like I said, what's the probability of it happening on a wide scale that would affect commercial uh, activity in, in North America? it's probably pretty low. The parallel that I'll run to this is gunshot, gunshot detection uh, in the United States. Unfortunately, we are suffering from a plague of active shooter events. And there are a variety of solutions, um, you know, and one of which RAD carries to help do gunshot detection, help, help shave precious seconds off of response time. Now, on the one hand, you might say, hey, we've got an active problem. And, and you'd figure, hey, everyone's going to be buying these things because we've got to shave those seconds off. We've got to get first responders better information. We've got to get, you know, people sheltering in place and doing whatever the SOPs uh, have in place for those types of events. But because the possibility of those events in the greater scheme of North American activity is relatively small, the buyers move slowly on it. So I'm, I'm drawing that parallel because although I believe that all of these elements are real and exist and will happen and are happening, I don't necessarily see uh, commercial activity in North America working to mitigate it simply because the uh, possibilities, you know, they'll rather roll the dice and, um, and, and hope that, you know, uh, we're spared. Really, I thought it was interesting. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. In some ways, that comes from the sort of sharp end of uh, uh, dealing in commercial realities. Uh, Richard, let me come to you with this question first, please. Um, um, J. Deepak Kumar Rao has uh, got a question, Richard, and it's about um, um, uh, where we go. Well, let me go about where we go with regulation. And uh, um, this was mentioned in the opening statements. Um, that it feels more comfortable as a novice, as an outsider, to say, regulate this as much as you can, be tight as you can on this one. It's too dangerous not to. Um, uh, do you understand that uh, positioning? And presumably you, you would question its, um, its value, would you? Yeah, and I, I would. And I think the natural, uh, the, the natural tendency is to increase regulation. And I think what we've got to do is really take a risk-based approach. Um, in the UK, for instance, you have to register if your drone is over 250 grams um, you and you have to take a test. You've got to pay, you've got to pay the, the government the, the permission to fly this. Now, I, I struggle somewhat to see, to see the, the reasoning for that argument because actually drones haven't caused that much 
that much disruption relatively to, to, to other things in the marketplace that are not regulated, for instance. I just sort of see drones being subject to this, uh, the Red Flag Act, as I said before, new technology. There isn't the sort of formalized uh, representative bodies that other more mature industries have to, to enable them to lo lobby government to try and reduce regulation. And I just come back to the fact that this is nascent technology, um, and Steve might be able to connect with this uh, message a bit more, that if I'm a teacher in a school and I'm going to introduce some, some technology to my physics lesson for my kids, uh, am I going to go down drone technology, which I, have to, which I have to then register? I've got to, I've got a whole bunch of admin that I have to, um, that comes with going down drone technology. Am I going to do something easier? And I think if we, the, the more we regulate um, to try and, mitigate security concerns, um, the, the, the more we're going to take away from legitimate drone use and those future drone innovators uh, five, 10 years down the line. Uh, and the bottom line, as I come back to, is that people don't commit crime in, in their own cars that they're registered to them. They don't shoot people with weapons registered to them. Why, is it, why do we think it's any different for drones? If, if criminals are going to use drones to commit crime, they're going to use drones to commit crime regulating a bloke flying a 250 gram drone in his back garden isn't going to solve that problem in my view okay thank you steve let me come to you because from a commercial perspective steve i mean again i assume this crops up um is it commercially better to have strong regulation or less regulation absolutely strong regulation when it comes to the drones there's no question about it to richard's point you know which i completely agree with right the crimes aren't committed with registered devices but it doesn't mean that we don't need regulation. We still need the regulation. Um, what I want to talk about in, in response to that question is enforcement of the regulation. Okay, like, you know, we've learned throughout this COVID period that um, as close as we might feel connected to the government, at the end of the day, we're kind of a little bit on our own, right? So it's kind of changed a little bit of the nature of the relationship between people and government. What that means to me is that there's going to be more unregulated activity. And quite frankly, I don't necessarily see an uptick in, in enforcement. So what I see is responsibility being pushed to the people to behave responsibly, which is a big ask. And I believe it's incumbent upon the manufacturers, whether you're getting from DGI, you're getting from RAD, you're getting from wherever you might, might be getting, to ensure that the technology available is compliant with the regulation so that we're mitigating it from the manufacturer side, we're limiting hobbyists' ability to get and create uh, un unregulated equipment. And that's, and that's how I think we're, we're, we're gonna be able to do the best that we can. Of course, it's gonna be a, uh, percentage of activity that's going to be unregulated and illegal and you know that's just that's just how life is it's with everything from vehicles to guns to, to to everything in life but you know definitely we have to set a standard of behavior set a standard of regulation have enforcement for when incidents happen and certainly you know enforcement kind of happens after the fact versus versus uh pre premeditated usually so um that that's how i see the world going very similar to how uh, other technologies exist Okay, just before I bring Jeff in on this, Steve, one follow-up question here. So who are the enforcers here? Yeah, I mean, in the United States, it's the FAA, right? Okay, uh, okay, okay. But, okay. you know, we, we're talking about an agency that, you know, we're talking about all government agencies being, uh, you know, having difficult relationships with funding and with enforcement and so forth. So uh, it becomes a complex question, and this really leads into the fourth industrial revolution. How does society look? What is our relationship with with our governments, what are our personal responsibilities? This revolution is going to fundamentally change those, and uh, and I think that's what's what's both exciting and terrifying. Okay, well, I agree with that. I mean, Jeff, um, um, should we be more excited or terrified? And to what extent can uh, regulation mediate the two? Um, well, uh, the the point there is there's a huge difference between regulation and enforcement and policing. Um, the FAA in the US and the CAA in the UK are involved or, or are responsible for regulation, but they're certainly not involved in policing. And most of the regulations that are in force um, are actually unenforceable. Um, this, uh, apart from the cooperative nature of, of manufacturers who, who are willing uh, to build in geofencing capabilities to drones to, to automatically exclude them from certain areas, particularly no-fly zones around airports and critical infrastructure, um, that they, they require both the cooperation of the manufacturer, and I have to say the biggest lobbyist of all is DJI. They do more time, spend more time and money lobbying the British government for, uh, to, to fix the regulation the way they prefer it to be than any other manufacturer it then being the biggest manufacturer of drones in the world based out of China. 
But the, the, the ability to be able to detect a drone inside an exclusion zone more than a kilometer or two is extremely limited. Now, I know that will, people will say, well, we've got RF detection systems which can detect the, the RF signatures of the drones in that space, and perhaps we have for the time being. But that doesn't necessarily that mean that's going to work in a few years' time when we have a more comprehensive uh, unmanned traffic management solutions around where all drones are ubiquitously co communicating using the same protocols on relatively insecure pieces of infrastructure using things like ADSB to identify themselves and locate themselves, all of which are spoofable and hackable. So the, the issue of regulation and policing is a, is a massively complicated one, but fundamental to it all is that we cannot effectively police the regulations that we currently have in force. And that's why it's so important that um, the people who are managing the security of pieces of critical infrastructure where the, the, inf were, um, uh, the in infringements by uh, small unmanned vehicles or larger unmanned vehicles in an uncontrolled manner by people who have hostile intent, uh, those things, they, people need to start thinking about how they actually change the way, the way they look at perimeter security and the protection of those, those pieces of infrastructure because they are no longer uh, managing a two-dimensional space with a fence around it, which keeps bad guys out. We're now talking about things that can fly over the fence. They move very quickly and they're incredibly difficult to detect. They can sit there for a very long time. Like most cyber attacks, for instance, are go un undetected. Uh, in most many cases, many drone infringements go undetected. And so when you ask a, a person that runs security for a piece of critical infrastructure whether they have a drone problem, they say no, because they've got no means of detecting whether there are drones there or not. Okay, we might be able to put some pieces of RF detection equipment up and detect pilots if they're, if they're piloted drones, but it's, that's becoming much, much less um, um, prevalent. And one band of the industry, people with hostile intent who have got the technical capability, which is not all that complicated, can fly without the use of um, without the use of uh, of, of um, an RF telemetry link. And in at the same time, in as we see the growth of com commercial use and the likely spread of UTM type infrastructure based on common infrastructure across across different facilities, it'll be impossible to be able to distinguish a good drone from a bad drone because they'll all be sitting on the same infrastructure. So it's a very complicated space. And the technology, in fact, involved in it is also very complicated, which is what makes it very expensive. Wow. OK, thank you very much. Well, look, uh, lead me on to the next question. Steve, I'm going to come to you first and then uh, you, Richard. And I thought I should be fairly brief, if you would, because I want to get through more questions. Steve, um, do, your, do your clients worry about accidents and can they get insurance? I mean, sooner or later, we're going to have a devastating one. I mean, I'm, I'm not... I'm just saying it's inevitable somewhere in the world something's going to go wrong here, isn't it? Um, and can you get insurance against it? I mean, how worried are they? Right now, because we don't have a proliferation of commercially used drones, uh, I don't have an answer to the insurance side. I can tell you on the unmanned ground vehicle side, and I can tell you in general, that the large entities, the end users that we deal with, both on the dealer side and the end user side, push insurance requirements down to us down to the manufacturer or the deploying entity. And in our case, getting insurance is, uh, is difficult and expensive, primarily because the insurance industry doesn't quite know what to do with us. They're, they're still getting their heads around unmanned ground vehicles. You throw drones into the, into the act and you know they, they hang up. So uh, we're working on other elements of insurance like errors and emissions, that kind of things. But the biggest piece of uh, what we're doing to insure ourselves, which is effectively what we're doing, is by creating and deploying perfect equipment or as good equipment as we possibly can, not being sloppy or careless uh, in both matching need to equipment and making sure that the equipment works, uh, works flawlessly. The other piece of this is that we expect, like early technology, as the rest of the industry and the rest of the world catches up, that when incidents happen, we settle it ourselves. So we don't expect to have large, uh, large insurance coverage. We expect to have to handle this ourselves. Um, and that's why avoidance of these incidents is so critical right now. Okay, that drives up standards, I suppose. Richard, um, similar or different for you? I think it's, I've got a slightly different point of view. And I think the, I'm coming at it from an insurance risk to a third party. Uh, so for instance, I don't think there's enough data out there quite yet for insurance companies to feel comfortable with, with, um, with autonomous vehicles, particularly drones. Um, anecdotally, I've seen over the past few years, drone insurance uh, premiums reduce, which is good. So that shows that the, data's, the data is there and it's getting better. Uh, and actually the losses that people fear are not materializing. But another, another example I'll give you is that um, we've deployed a system that creates an active geofence around a prison 
in Guernsey. So as, as Jeff was mentioning about sort of linked to that unenforceable element is that we, we deployed this thing called Skyfence, which does a directional jam above the prison's airspace. And the biggest problem we had to deploying that system was getting it insured. Uh, we had to find an insurance company that would, that would bear the risk if a drone hit Skyfence, bounced off, and caused a multiple fatality car accident. Uh, and it, that, that was the hardest bit, was, uh, was, was getting that third party um, risk covered. Interesting. So, I mean, out there, it's a problem. I'm going to move on quickly if I can, because I want to just uh, see if I can get to a few more questions. Uh, um, uh, uh, let me come to you, Jeff. I mean, you've just mentioned uh, um, different types of threats. I mean, uh, we've got this question um, from Pushka Tripathi about cyber security and border security. Um, I'm guessing, I mean, we've mentioned the cloud that's cropped up. This strikes me as, and you mentioned the different types of concerns, uh, Jeff. To what extent is cyber security uh, endemic to the problem we've got with drones? Um, well, there, there, there is a kind of a, there's a direct link and there's a sort of an indirect link. The, the direct link being the fact that um, you can do a lot of things with drones that you can't do any other way or any other way cheaply and easily. And one of the things that you can do is you can go places that you can't get to easily, like up the side of an office building, for instance, or you can get into a perimeter and close to a, a building, for instance, without anybody knowing that you're doing it. And under those circumstances, you can do what, uh, what, what used to be called war driving, which is where you, you drive around with an open access point and you look for other unsecured access points and you gather credentials and information about, about, about those access points that you can then use to, 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 to hack into their networks. So there's a kind of a direct route into to certain elements of cyber uh, via, um, via drones, where you're using a drone as a vehicle effectively to give you connectivity to, to physical location to give you connectivity into somebody else's network. But much more, much more, I think much more prevalent um, is the fact that more and more drones, if you, if you think of your mobile phone, for instance, you have a mapping system on your mobile phone that's maybe Bing or it's maybe Google Maps or whatever, and you have a GPS receiver in your phone which tells you where you are, uh, and then a communication system with your phone that tells you how to communicate or uh, how to travel around. But a lot of the functions and features that are inside that, that system, say for instance, within Waze, for instance, a lot of the functionality that you get, um, the reason why you're able to get it really, really cheaply in a, in a very, very uh, uh, readily available manner via lots and lots of services, is the fact that it uses lots of pre-built components, software components from other providers uh, via the cloud, usually either to the original software vendor or as part of the platform that, that delivers that service out to the world. And a lot of drones, in order to make them real cheap uh, and really quick and to be able to um, minimize the, the burden of software development on the manufacturer, they use lots and lots of third-party software components to, put, to, put, to cobble together their, their, their products and sell them out into the, into the open market. And it's extremely difficult to maintain the security of that supply chain and know that every single part of every single software component that you're, you're including in your system is going to be secure. And also that the end user is knowledgeable enough to make sure that they close off all of the possible routes for information to leak out of their devices into these applications and be fed back elsewhere. We've actually just seen some, uh, some more instances in the last couple of weeks of pieces of software. Actually, it was t televisions, smart TVs in the, in the, uh, East, the Asian market that were being used to gather information about other wireless devices inside people's homes and feed that back to the manufacturer and to an analytics company who was then driving uh, targeted marketing towards people. Now, these are there's not necessarily particularly uh, hostile, but as we already know from things like the Stuxnet uh, release and et cetera, people, once um, cyber attacks, cyber vulnerabilities start to get out into the marketplace via the internet, it's unbelievably difficult to keep them under control. And before you know it, they can be infecting everybody's machines and doing all kinds of things that you didn't expect them to do. So the cyber elephant element is there, the cyber elephant in the room. The cyber element in the room is, is always there in all of these complex software systems and drones are just another one of those. Uh, and obviously you have to worry about vulnerabilities in complex pieces of, of, uh, of software, particularly where they're handling things like eVTOL vehicles if they ever become uh, autonomous because these things are very large. They weigh a couple of tons. They've got maybe four or five people inside them and they're flying above our cities. Okay, really, really interesting. Jeff, so, Steve, you're not in there. Do you just want to come in very, very quickly with mine? Steve, I want to get one more question in. Jeff Handel, uh, Jeff, Jeff hit something very important, which is uh, how 
often this technology is cobbled together using open source or unknown types of software. Uh, we take personally, uh, we take a very important, so at RAD, we uh, engineer and write the software from the base code all the way through the end of it so that we control the entire cycle of it. We know every element of it, and that fits in with the cyber uh, security certifications uh, that we have in place or that we're working on right now. So it's, it's I, I can't, I, I want to emphasize that point because it's a critical point. And the point is, so there's something we can do about it, I suppose. But, something we but of can course, do, but yes. you're going to charge more accordingly, though. I mean, it's a better system, so it costs more. And I guess there'll always be those who are going to race to the bottom, I suppose, too. Yes, but I, I think that it's going to be essential. I think that trusted software and, and platforms that have trusted software uh, certifications uh, are going to be more or less the, the regulated, uh, approved platforms in the future. Otherwise, it's it's uncontrollable. Okay, thank you. Richard, I'd like to come to you with a final question by Mike. I'm going to ask you to be brief, uh, Richard, for running out of time. Uh, both Bipin and Patel and Dennis Shep have asked a similar question, really. Uh, um, can, uh, how was the danger of a, uh, um, a drone hitting a plane? Richard, I mean, should we worry about this? Because it, in Britain, uh, we had quite a big incident a couple of years ago at an airport, and uh, the airport was closed for a few days, Richard. I think many people that sort of coloured their views of the potential of drones and, and the worries. To what extent should that be a worry, Richard? I, do, I think there's two, two ways to answer this question. The first is like, a, if we imagine, let's use an analogy of lightning. Uh, a plane is hardened against being struck by lightning, uh, but if there's a storm around the airport, you don't take off. You just wait for it to pass because of the really tiny risk that the storm could cause damage to the aircraft, even though it's protected against it. But, the chances of a drone doing something really damaging to a passenger airliner to cause catastrophic failure, I think is really, really small. Uh, smaller aircraft, helicopters, different different risk profile. But I, I think it's, it's very, very small, but it's not a risk we can tolerate. So we have to address it. And, and I suppose uh, this is Bipkin's Patel's question. Very briefly, how do we address it very briefly? Uh, so we, we have to understand what's going on in our airspace. So we have to track all aircraft, whether they're drones. When we have bird tracking radars to stop bird strikes, we have to have the same sort of technology at, uh, at critical points like airports. OK, OK. Uh, um, uh, panel, we could go on. We've got more questions. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. I to, I've got to say, a lot of this was news to me. It's uh, really, really interesting to hear the debate. Uh, something we're definitely going to come back to. There's uh, so much good stuff there. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to the audience for questions. I'm sorry we didn't get into all your questions. I mean, there were just too many good ones. And uh, um, we will come back to it. And perhaps the, uh, the good thing is we, we leave you wanting more, including me, as it happens. Um, so thank you very much indeed for that. A few final comments from me, if I might, just very, very quickly, just to say we have got a major study going on, looking at what security officers think about their role and that of the world. Can you please encourage security officers to complete a survey? We want each one of them out there in those countries to do their bit by just taking a, a, a give us their views on uh, what they're doing. Um, we'll send you the link afterwards. Uh, just to say the OSPAs are open in Kenya, Romania and the US. And as from today, they've opened in the Benelux, the Outstanding Security Performance Awards. Get your entries in early in, in the UK, the Tackling Economic Crime Awards. And uh, um, also to tell you the cyber security, the OSPAs are open, the cyber OSPAs. Look at all those associations from around the world who are taking part. More are lined up. If you know a cyber security association not there, contact us, we'd love to involve them, we're getting a lot of support for that initiative. And finally to say, uh, don't forget we're normally here on a Thursday, we're not here tomorrow, we're here today instead, but we're back next Tuesday when the topic is about money laundering reporting, how effective is it? Money laundering is the key to organized crime, it's the fuel that keeps it going. Do we have it under control? And next Thursday, the CISO or the, the, the um, head of corporate security, should it be uh, um, from an information security cyber background or a physical security background, which is the most important and why, and has COVID made any difference? That's next Thursday. Thank you very much indeed once again, audience, for joining us from around the world. Thank you once again to my panel for your expert insights. Thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you to Christine Brooks and Hannah Miller in the background. I very much hope we'll meet again soon, hopefully next Tuesday, same time. Wherever you are in the world, until we meet again, stay safe.